no conference these days is complete without looking at uh, you know some type of policy response or policy implications of of COVID. And so here, um, Shabnan, uh, together with uh, Pia Olivier Gurinchas, uh, Veronika Benciakova, I hope I pronounce her name correctly, and Nick Sander have looked at fiscal policy in the age of COVID. Does it really get in all of the cracks? Um, so, um, Shabnan, like um, was the case for Gendot, you would have 30 minutes for your presentation. And the discussant of this paper will be Fabiano Schivardi um, from the Bruges University. Uh, all right, great. So, uh, thank you so much for uh, putting our paper in the program. Uh, it is a privilege to be part of this amazing uh, two day conference on uh, fiscal governance in European Monetary Union. And our paper is uh, also very well placed. So it is going to follow very nicely from the uh, paper we just heard on Big G. Uh, we will be also looking at different uh, fiscal policies, uh, you know, direct support to firms versus transfers. Uh, but we are going to do it for, for COVID. Uh, and uh, this is actually the paper we wrote for the 2021 Jackson Hall paper. Uh, again, joined with Piero de Goncha, Veronica Penciokova, and Nick Sender. And I also have to say, because uh, two of uh, my co-authors are working at central banks, these are our views and uh, do not represent the views of the institutions. So, um, it is going to be an uh, uh, applied uh, policy paper, uh, but we are also going to have some uh, uh, very uh, interesting modeling exercise in the in the paper, and we are going to do two different uh, exercises for that. So to make that clear, I would like to first start with this slide. In terms of what kind of a shock COVID is, of course, we all know now that it is a very atypical macro shock. It is a very uneven shock, uh, as I said. The paper uh, uh, is written for the Jackson Hole uh, conference this year, and Jackson Hole conference was about unevenness of COVID and also unevenness of the policy response. And that's really what we were trying to do in the paper to really get at these issues. Now, to, to start, uh, just like beginning, yet yeah, right now we are two years into this, but just to start in 2020, of course, Everything starts with a great lockdown, uh, as uh, coined by Gita Gopinath at the IMF. So there are going to be uh, these uh, several uh, government-mandated lockdowns with amazing cross-sector and cross-country heterogeneity that we are going to take into account. So that that's your starting supply shock. Then the sectoral heterogeneity hits you, which which really makes it very different than how you think a supply shock in as of 1970s style oil price cost was shock. So clearly this is not that because you are not going to be subject to this uh, throughout the COVID episode all two years. Uh, every country, every sector, there is going to be this extreme sectoral heterogeneity and of course country heterogeneity. So the original negative supply shock in certain sectors is going to create these negative demand shocks in other sectors. Uh, you know, you cross borders, demand for travel goes down, and the, this idea is, uh, you know, uh, modeled uh, now by, uh, in, in several papers by Veronica Guerrieri, Ivan Learning, Ludwig Straub, and others. So, this idea of Keynesian supply shock. So, supply shock creates its own demand shock. And of course, COVID is a demand shock at the same time. Uh, again, sectoral, right? It's, it doesn't have to be negative for every sector. This kind of fear factor, you are fearful of going out because of the uh, transmission of the virus. Well, that's not true for every sector, right? It is actually going to be positive for some sector, negative for some sectors. This is the typical restaurant versus grocery deliveries example. Then on top of that, you have this propagation and amplification through the trade and production network. And this is going to work, obviously, domestically, but globally, right? In fact, uh, one of our arguments is going to be that thinking this in a domestic closed economy model is not the right way to go uh, because uh, trade and production networks are global. And this is obviously what we have been living through now over a year. Uh, the, the, the shortage, not just in labor, but everywhere from microchips. Uh, affecting car production, restaurant affecting luxury foods and all that. So this is this has a global nature to it, not just domestic. And domestic and global is going to be interact and amplifying things. Then 
we come to the later phase where demand normalizes. This is, of course, the, the big achievement of the policy, especially fiscal policy. And unfortunately, that is going to create further supply shocks uh, because, uh, you know, higher demand in certain sectors are going to create uh, supply constraints in other sectors. And that's the, uh, the, the later phase we are living through in terms of both the inflation debate and then this great, what I actually call great supply chain disruption, uh, which started early on, but <laughs> intensified because of this uh, unbelievable stimulus to demand, which again, going to be not even very uneven, not only across sectors, but across countries. Okay, so this, this, is, this is the setup we are working with. The international dimension is going to be super important because, again, we are trying to understand fiscal policy during this era, and obviously inequality in fiscal space is going to be a number one issue here. As I said, COVID is going to be global and production networks are global, which is going to carry things around. But of course, the fiscal transfers, the large ones, are going to be made in advanced economies. So that's going to have important implications in terms of cross-border spillovers of fiscal policy, which is going to be very different than the standard models tell us, right? So uh, that's something we are going to be focusing on. And on top of that, of course, fiscal policy is not just the transfer policy. There has been extensive direct liquidity support to firms and also household, but mostly to firms. And that's what we also want to look at in the paper. So again, the paper is going to try to understand these issues, the broad effects of fiscal policy on the COVID, but in a globalized world. So that's going to be very important for us, the open economy dimension, because a lot of the standard results are going to be different once we start thinking in terms of open economy. And, and I think this is really the priority right now for COVID. We, we know that we are not going to get out of this uh, until everybody gets out of this. So this is a global pandemic, but it is not just like the pandemic side. This is not just about you know, virus mutating in South Africa and coming to US, Omicron part. It is going to directly impact the economies, right? You just cannot recover your economy by yourself without the, the entire global world recovers. And so that's kind of the approach now I have been taking in several of the COVID papers I did. And here we are going to look through the, that lens and try to understand the fiscal policy under COVID in a globalized way. Okay. So we are going to do two quantitative models to answer uh, uh, four questions. And of course, in a, in a limited time, I'm not going to go through details of the models. Uh, everything is in the paper, and I, I assume my discussant is going to comment some of those things. But basically, these two models are going to give us eight results. Okay, so there are going to be eight main results in the paper, and that's what I'm going to show you in this 30-minute uh, presentation. Now, why do we do two quantitative models uh, instead of one, because we would like to answer these questions you see on the left hand side of the screen. First is how we started this research agenda. We have another paper, same four set of uh, co authors looking at the SME failures under COVID. So, first, we would like to understand that, right? Is fiscal policy provide enough liquidity support to struggling SMEs? So, here we are not talking about sp uh, spending and, and transfers, uh, transfer spending, as we just uh, heard in the previous paper. So, but it's very much like this big G concept, right? So there have been, uh, if you want, over 500 programs in 30 countries that we will be looking at just to support SMEs, just to support SMEs. This is not about supporting airlines. This is not sending checks to households. This is literally to support small, medium enterprise. So we want to understand how successful that is. And the answer to that question is, these policies were super poorly targeted. Understandably, these programs put together in a week, basically, both in Europe and the United States and other countries. So they were poorly targeted, but they were largely successful. We define success in terms of reducing the SME failures. They literally reduced SME failures because we are going to show you a counterfactual SME failure from our model in the absence of this immense a liquidity support to firms. So in that sense, policy is going to be successful. And also there is this other uh, silver lining because there's going to be waste and inefficiency as they are poorly targeted. The silver lining will be they didn't create zombies. So in, in spite of the entire media coverage of this, this panic mood last year in terms of all those sorts of zombies coming and we are going to face a wall of zombies, of course, this is really linked to the 2008-2010 crisis you know, because that was uh, largely uh, the, the case then, although the literature still didn't have a consensus on that. My court, my discussant uh, did a lot of work on that. For this crisis, for COVID, 
and uh, the policy support for the SMEs, we did not find the result that this policy support created zone returns. I'm going to show you detailed numbers on that. Okay, our second question is this fiscal stimulus health support aggregate activity. So now this is more in line of uh, the previous paper presented. We are going to be looking at transfers here. And we actually are going to find a very, very uh, low multiplier, but that doesn't mean fiscal policies are unsuccessful. We will explain why we found that 0.06 multiplier. I mean, there are going to be some similar reasons to the previous paper, but more importantly, we have this supply constraint and the IO linkage is going to play a very important role for us on top of the nominal rigidities. So we, we still think fiscal policy is successful here because it is reallocating demand towards sector itself. So low demand sectors are going to be getting higher demand and that is helping uh, overall employment. So in, in the traditional sense of fiscal multipliers, we are going to find a low number, but in terms of if you wish an employment multiplier, actually, uh, the policy uh, has been largely successful. Then we go to our global dimension and we ask how big are fiscal policy flows globally? Because there's this sense that, especially early on, uh, a lot of uh, policy commentary was on the, the fact that there is tremendous spending in US and Europe in advanced economies, and that is good for everyone. That is, of course, a standard uh, you know, thinking in terms of trade. US consumers now are going to spend a lot. That's going to be great for the you know, Mexicans and all the other countries. We actually find that that's not the case because this is a very different shock, and, and there are all these issues with the supply chain. So fiscal policy floors are going to be small. They are all positive on the employment. So you are definitely going to be helping the employment in other countries, but unfortunately the output, they're actually going to be negative, beggar thy neighbor on the, on the other countries, other countries being emerging markets here. So we are not going to find the result that advanced economy fiscal tide is, uh, it's not going to lift all the boats. Uh, and then finally, of course, this is going to put the importance of this question even higher, implication of a two-speed recovery. I mean, we, this is completely about the unequal global vaccinations in the world, and we are going to be in this for some time right now, unfortunately, given the uh, much higher vaccination advanced economies versus emerging markets, and that is combined with this unbelievable fiscal stimulus, we are going to show you that there is going to be an effect on, unfortunately, global interest rates, and that is going to be a double whammy on emerging markets because risk premium in emerging markets is going to increase and that this is going to mean that there's going to be strong headwinds for emerging markets. So overall, we are going to find that fiscal policy can get in all of the domestic cracks, but it is all about the fiscal space, something advanced economies have, but emerging markets countries do not. Okay, let me start with the first part of the paper. Again, without going to the details of the model, there is a very simple model there uh, that tries to understand the uh, optimal decision making on the firm side. So we are going to model these individual firms behavior. They will be operating in different sectors and the economy is linked to each other through a very rich input output structure and extensive margin, meaning that firms fail in certain sectors. The demand is going to be reallocated to the surviving firms in that sector. So the price adjustment is going to help that. So wages are going to be rigid, rigid but prices are going to be adjusted. And here we are going to calibrate this uh, by doing a very detailed calibration of the COVID shock. Now, COVID shock is going to be several things. It's going to be a sectoral supply shock, sectoral demand shock, and an energy demand shock. And we are going to pin this down using uh, uh, real-time data at the country time sector level. So the sectoral supply shock is going to go back to uh, the lockdown stringency uh, from Oxford and the ONET data in terms of if you can do work remotely or not. Demand shocks, again, we are going to use Google Mobility data and also the face-to-face -face interaction at your job uh, in that sector. And the aggregate demand we are going to get from realized GDP and forecasted GDP growth from via of the IMF. So the idea here is basically we have an optimized equation and then decision of firms failing when firms' liquidity uh, and operating profits are falling short of to cover their expenses. And we map that, we estimate that equation using firm-level financial data at the entry of COVID. So we are going to use firm-level financial statement from 2018 for 18 advanced economies and nine emerging markets. And basically, we will be shocking uh, these firms' uh, uh, balance sheets with these the COVID shocks, you uh, calibrated with the real time data, and then first show you a counterfactual firm failure rate without the policy. 
Of course, this is not the real world because there was tremendous police support, as I told you. And this part of the paper, we are going to only focus on support to firms directly. And as I, as I told you, there are just over 500 scams. So we are going to focus on three because that is, uh, these are the, not only the common policies across these 18 advanced economies online emerging markets, we also have data on them from ECB, ESRB, and OECD. And the policies we are going to be looking at tax waivers, cash grants, and pandemic. Okay, so we are going to be calibrating fiscal support to this and then then calculate, okay, that's a uh, counterfactual SME failure rate in the absence of policy, uh, how much that goes down with this support, tax waivers, cash grants, and pandemic funds. Before showing you that result, let me show you the shocks, uh, because this is going to be very, very important, of course. Everything is about how you uh, measure these COVID shocks, uh, the, the rich heterogene heterogeneity in the sector dimension. So here, the color coding in this slide is going to tell the sectors that are essential, they are going to be orange, and the, the dark blue sectors are going to be non-essential. Now, the left figure is going to show, show the sector-specific supply shock, using the data I mentioned, and you see from the y axis, it is, it is going to be very intense. So supply shocks are going to be more intense here than the demand shocks. That's what the data tells us. And the demand shocks are going to be on the right, uh, where it is not always negative, as you see, it is, it, is, it is a relative shock, right? It's going to be negative in certain sectors, largely negative, uh, like entertainment and recreation, but it's also going to be positive in other sectors, such as electricity, transportation, and storage, and construction, okay? So there's going to be this positive negative demand shock sector and the sector of supply shock. Now, in terms of intensity, I told you supply shock is always going to be, oops, sorry, uh, more intense. Like you can see from the scale going up to uh, almost uh, this indicator of 60, and there's going to be amazing country heterogeneity. Italy is being very intense. Uh, some other countries uh, less. So this depends on your lockdowns. Uh, and uh, demand shock is going to be also going to depend a lot how you know consumers behave and all that but basically uh, the intensity is going to be less you can see why emerging markets everything is just worse right i know this is supply shock is going to be worse emerging markets they did much more lockdowns we do know that uh but there is also going to be a higher intensity for the demand shock. now so this heterogeneity is going to be very important so we are going to be uh working with sector country heterogeneity to calibrate the COVID shock and firm heterogeneity, of course, in terms of your initial balance sheet, initial financial position as a firm in all these countries. We have firm balance sheet data from all these countries. How, what type of a financial position as a firm you were in when you face these sector of COVID shocks, depending on which sectors you are, you are operating. And of course, some firms might be operating in different sectors. Our first result is, uh, as I have told you before, so fiscal support is going to reduce SME failures more than half. So oops, where do we see that? So in the first column here, you see the failure rate is nine percentage point increase. So we are going to show deltas always. So delta means how much the failure rate increased uh, uh, in COVID relative to non-COVID. So there's a nine percentage point increase in the failure rate in all countries in COVID. And you see that much higher number in emerging markets, almost 13 percentage point increase, and in advanced economies, around 5.65 percentage point increase. But the fiscal support, you see what happens to the numbers with the fiscal support. So first of all, overall increase is healthy, right? So this is our first result. Fiscal support reduces SME failures more than half. Your nine percentage point increase in the SME failure in the counterfactual scenario of no policy help uh, came, that becomes 4.3 with the policy support. And remember the policy support we are looking at. We are just doing three here, pandemic loan, tax waiver, and cash grant. Now, there is a full offset in advanced economies. Advanced economies is so much that actually you are doing better on the COVID relative to um, normal time business cycle exit. And in emerging markets, you still reduce 12 to 9, but obviously it is never, it is nothing like a full offset in the advanced economies. And that's solely due to the size of the fiscal program in advanced economies. Now, as I told you, these are going to be poorly targeted. The support in terms of G percent of GDP that is going to be around 4%. And most, as I said, is spent by uh, advanced economies, 6% of GDP, where emerging markets are spending only 1.9% of GDP. Again, these are these three programs we are looking at. And they are very poorly targeted. We show that 88% of the funds dispersed, these are the dispersed funds, right? 
So you can get some bad. In that sense, we are not calling them the fiscal fault cost, but dispersed funds, 88% of them went to viable firms. So it went to firms who didn't need it actually. And uh, so that's the pool targeting. And this third result, the second result is pool targeting. Third result of no zone modification comes from the fact that our estimated 2021 failure rate is only 2.6 percent above, above normal, meaning, oh, is it the case that we saved all these firms in 2020 and they're all zombies that they are going to fail in 2021? The answer is no. The firms you are saving are actually mostly mild after the policies. Okay? So the, the answer to the question, did fiscal support provide enough liquidity to struggling firms? Yes, it is poorly targeting, but it definitely reduced SME failures, fully offsetting them in advanced economies without creating zones. Now, there is, again, please do not forget the extensive country heterogeneity. Uh, I don't have time to go to details in the presentation, but basically you can see a simple picture of this year. On the left, the baseline failure rates country by country in dark blue, and what the policy does in orange in advanced countries. You see several countries turn negative, a big spender like Germany here. You see that it is more than flat set. And of course, Germany is an interesting case because uh, there is also a, a, a regulation, a ban on filing a bankruptcy. So it is, it is actually extremely difficult to understand what is going on also in real time, uh, as we, we are not going to get real time data without before two years. And then countries like Germany banning the filing of bankruptcies, you know, it is going to be actually a, quite a heroic exercise to do this. But basically, uh, you know, it is, there's going to be a country heterogeneity, but still for advanced countries, you see a huge decrease in emerging markets. Uh, policy is reducing it, and there are going to be countries that are also going to negative, like Poland, but of, also there are going to be countries like Romania and Bulgaria with so little spend, uh, you know, policy is not being that effective at all. So again, it is about fiscal space. Now, from this model, we are going to go to a global model. Why are we doing this? So this firm failure model, that gives you the, uh, the uh, firm uh, failure without the policy and then shows you what policy did. Then we want to understand the added effects of fiscal, fiscal policy in a globalized world. Remember, in an open economy setting, here uh, we, are, we really want to look at fiscal transfers. Okay, so the firm failure model cannot do that because there's going to be, a, first of all, aggregate demand is going to be exogenous. So we cannot look at transfers to households. The IO linkages are not linked in an open economy sense. Everybody's IO linkages to themselves, domestic. Even we work with 27 countries in the firm model, so we cannot talk about international spillovers. And it's also a static model. There is not going to be any savings chart. Now, the global model, we are going to solve overall spending as an equilibrium object. There is going to be intertemporal issues with constant households. So we have this full-fledged heterogeneity in terms of the fiscal transfers and multipliers. Literature, there are going to be households constrained. There are going to be households not constrained. And, and the, their NPCs are going to be important. So that's going to give us a very nice framework to understand the effectiveness of fiscal transfers. And most importantly, as I have been saying, this is a global model. So IO linkages is going to be very important in terms of these cross-border fiscal spillovers. And we are going to use data on that from OECD on global production and trade network for 64 countries and 36 sectors. So this, these are going to be the improvements. The second model in the paper on the first model, the cost is, of course, we cannot use firm data anymore. Okay. Let me first show you this picture to make the, to make the point. Again, we, the, the model here, I don't have time to go to details, but it's a global dynamic heterogeneous agents model with nominal rigidities, and we are going to calibrate it using data on global trade and production network. Now, what do we mean when we say global trade and production network? Let me, let me clarify that because the, the first thing people always think about is, is a trade network. It is not simply a trade network because there is the sectoral dimension. So the left here, and by the way, these figures are from my uh, paper titled The Economic Case for Global Vaccinations that we have written in January 2021 and make the case that uh, the pandemic is not going to be over until it is over uh, everywhere and no economy recovers until everyone recovers because in this paper, basically, it is an epidemiological macro model, a global uh, model, and there in that paper, we, we simply made the economic case for global vaccinations not the ethical case, because not vaccinating Brazil's, Mexico's, Turkey's, and Africa's of the world is going to cost a lot to European Union and, and United States. And in fact, yesterday at the opening panel, Helen Ray quoted these numbers from this paper showing the cost of not vaccinating the rest of the world is 20% for France and how this is going to improve fiscal governance in France. So this was in Helen Ray's presentation. 
So basically, this cost is going to go through this trade and production linkages, but it's not just simply this trade, but it is this non-linearity in the domestic IO linkages that intersects with that trade. And that insight is very famously uh, from the uh, recent work of uh, uh, David Bakai and, and late Emmanuel Fahri, who we lost uh, last year. So this vaccination paper fully take their framework and basically uh, carries this to an empirical setting to make the economic case for global vaccination. So here in our paper with Pioli, Via Veronica and, and um, Nick, we use exact same data, and these figures are actually from my vaccination paper, but I'm showing you here to make this point. So on the left, you see the trade network, and you see it is color-coded because, and by the way, this is a, a stripped-down version where I am showing the largest trade, like over 15%, because if I show you everything, it's, it's like a spider web, and you are not going to see anything, right? But the point I want to make here is, yeah, there are large countries, small countries, and the color code is there are very open countries like Ireland here, very dark blue, and they are not that open countries like China and US. They are larger, but they are less open in terms of trade and like Okay, now you have what you should envi envision is you incorporate this domestic IO matrix, which we mostly think more like a structural relationship, right? You want to produce a car, you need four tires and all, but some of these sectors are tradable, some of these sectors are not. This is, is going to be fully incorporated into this. That's what a global trade and production network, and that's exactly why we are leading to the supply chain issue, great supply chain disruption. Then we have these sectors with different demand and supply shock, demand normalizing at different times. This is going to be very important here for our paper when we under, want to understand the effect of this proposal. If you look at the figure on the right, again, there are going to be these very tradable sectors like computers, electrics, you know, manufacturing sectors, but there are all these sectors, construction, wholesale and retail. You know, they are not agricultural and fishing. They are not that tradable, but they are all linked to the other sectors. And these links are the things that are going to be, and non-linearities are going to be this amplification. Again, this insight is coming from Baki and Paris. Work. This is going to be very important, and that's exactly what it means when we talk about the lumber stuff and the other stuff in the in the uh, uh, literature, and then you just go to the Starbucks and you start seeing signs of like, okay, we are not uh, being able to get our uh, inputs and labor, so uh, the service is going to be so, so. So it is not just, you know, what we trade, but it is all these linkages together with the domestic uh, IO network. So we are going to use this data and how we are going to make use of it to understand the fiscal policy in a global context. Basically, we say, okay, now let's focus on transfers. Again, this is uh, going to be uh, very related to the previous paper. We are going to look at transfers. And again, of course, fiscal space is going to be very important. Here. If you look at this figure, these are the countries we work with. And here, obviously, advanced economy, United States at the top, on average, the transfer spending is going to be almost 16% of GDP in advanced economies. You look at the emerging markets, high is Brazil, but it is, of course, very, very little compared to what advanced economies spend. I mean, you can see that, like, you know, Mexico almost did nothing. It's 4.9%. Okay. So, in a world like that, of course, it's very important. I mean, a country like Mexico wants to, you know, understand, well, they didn't spend much, but thank God their trading partner, US, spent so much. So, is it going to be good for Mexico? So this is, and in the standard model, yes, it's going to be good for Mexico. And we are going to find it's going to be good for Mexico, but it's going to be bad for the other countries, exactly because of these different linkages and the rising global rates and uh, the uh, the uh, uh, amplification and then the different shots. Okay, now let me go through that results. First, our first result, result number four, says that there are going to be sizable demand constraints. Okay, so we are going to separate sectors in uh, terms of supply and demand constraints. Of course, 70% of the sectors are going to be supply constraint, 31% are going to be demand constraint, but that means like 31% of global GDP, global GDP is like our 27 countries, is going to be in demand constraints. Okay, there's going to be low demand. So before the fiscal policy, and that goes back to the figures I showed you, just the, the sectoral shock, the, the COVID shock in terms of intensity supply shock is going to be more intense. Okay. Now, but what does it mean? I and mean, you start with this, you have 31% of the global GDP in demand constraint sectors. What does it mean in terms of what can fiscal transfers do? Of course, the law multiplier is going to be very low, right? So we are going to have a 0.67% stimulus for 11.3% fiscal impulse. 11.3 is the average of those numbers I just showed you, 15 and 4 in advanced economies and emerging markets. The multiplier is point of right? This is going to be very low multiplier. But we, we think just looking at numbers is misleading because, and in fact, in the paper we show, we, start, we started a standard textbook multiplier and we bring it down 
to 0.06. Why? Because of supply buckle bottlenecks. And two, many policies, the transfers are not designed to stimulate output, as you know, we have discussed in the previous paper. However, the policy is successful in terms of employment support. Why? Exactly because of this heterogeneity uneven across sectors. If you have these sectors where there is slack in demand, fiscal policy can reallocate the demand. And in fact, that's what happened. Fiscal policy is going to reallocate the uh, demand to those uh, demand constrained sector that is going to help the employment and this Keynesian employment, right? Because it was there at the first place because of these Keynesian supply shocks. Uh, so that is going to decrease a lot. So that's going to decrease from 2.67% to 1.4%. So even though uh, the change in real GDP is 0.6, the change in the Keynesian unemployment is minus 1.3. So that is another success. For, for fiscal policy in our view, okay? Despite the low multiplier, fiscal policy is reallocating spending to more towards the sector with slack. Uh, uh, so that is, again, uh, something very important now. What about spillovers? In spite of this uh, domestic success, the spillovers here, international spillovers are going to be small and mostly negative. And that's going to come from interest rate in terms of trade effects. Now, employments are going to be small, but mostly positive because demand, uh, extra demand created in the sectors with slack. Here's a figure showing this, and I'm only going to, we have several things in the paper, of course, doing it, advanced economy stimulus, that country stimulus. Let me show you the only US, the biggest spender. US uh, uh, stimulus, what is the spillover of that to other countries? Of course, the effect is largest on US itself. This is output. And you see Canada and Mexico, the most important trading partners, they also have positive effects. I mean, slow, but positive, at least in the right direction. Everybody else exactly in the wrong direction. Okay, so that's going to be a very important result out of our paper, which obviously you are not going to get with the, with the standard shock and standard model. So there's the, the shock is also very important here, not just not just the, not just the, 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 the global nature of the model. Unemployment spillovers again, you know, we are doing good here. They are going to be small but still positive. So because the share of the demand constraint sector is declining around three percentage points. Uh, unemployment is declining around almost at one percentage point, more more in U.S. and uh, you know, uh, but also in emerging markets, right? So it is so in terms of unemployment, uh, the it is U.S. fiscal policy helping reducing unemployment in other countries. So again, the fiscal policy flows are not that big, small, but uh, uh, in terms of employment, they are all positive, good news. In terms of output, unfortunately. They are not going to be positive, so there isn't this sense of advanced economy spending lifting uh, all the boats up. So, which again makes the importance of global vaccinations uh, uh, number one issue. Okay, my final thing is going to be on uh, two speed recovery. Now, this is again, this is this is this is I think the only important issue right now. This uh, this stupid inequality in global vaccinations, uh, which I think none of us understands why we are still in this world. Uh, the return to investing in this uh, global vaccinating the world is huge. In our January paper, we calculated 166 times return to advanced country investment in vaccinating the rest of the world. This is still not done. IMF actually put out a proposal uh, in May, uh, is, you know, calculating the total uh, amount, which is going to be 50 billion. So it is, it is, it is a very small cost to vaccinate the rest of the world, but it is not done, and we are in a two-speed recovery. That is combined with fiscal stimulus, the huge fiscal stimulus in advanced economies is going to have very damaging effect for emerging markets. First of all, obviously, the, the decrease in the private saving is going to increase global interest rates uh, through uh, the advanced economy channel. That's going to increase the global imbalances. So in terms of the trade balance, of course, this is a, that's, that's a standard model. You are going to get a deteriorating trade balance in advanced economies, improving the emerging markets. But what is important here is Yes, output is increasing at advanced economies, but it is declining. Okay, so there is going to be a almost one percent uh, uh, decline in output in real GDP in emerging markets relative to 2020. This is real GDP. Okay, and the increase in the global interest rate is going to be 2.6 percent. Now, this, there is going to be a double whammy to emerging markets. Why? Because this higher global rates is going to translate to higher risk premium for emerging markets. And on top of that, if U.S. monetary policy responds with a tightening because of obviously this inflation issue driven by the supply chain disruption, that's going to be even worse for emerging markets because of this high risk premium. And we show it here in this figure, this is by the way, updating the, this result from my 2019 Jackson Hole paper where I there showed first time this asymmetric effect of a contractionary US monetary policy on emerging market 
spreads here on the left, a contraction monetary policy increases the spreads in emerging markets, so on spreads, and it decreases then the advanced economies. Okay, so here we are updating that result and uh, with uh, data pretty much till the end of uh, 2020. And, you know, and, and with a surprise contraction in monetary policy, there is going to be a higher risk premium uh, for emerging markets. So even higher uh, external borrowing costs because higher global rates time frame plus the risk premium, you are going to have huge costs for external financing for emerging markets. So what are the implications of the two-speed recovery in this world of unequal global vaccinations? Increase from our model, increasing global rates, widening global imbalances, financial headwinds for the emerging markets. Okay, let me conclude. So our paper shows that fiscal policy did get in all of the domestic cracks. This is very important. So this is in our title, inspired by Jeremy Stein's uh, famous quote of monetary policy getting in all cracks or not. So uh, fiscal policy is getting in all the cracks, but domestic. So your domestic fiscal uh, space matters above all. In terms of firms, uh, SMEs fundamentals are strong and they don't need additional support. This is, by the way, not a futuristic five years down the road statement. We are talking about uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, the multiplier from fiscal transfers is very small. That's not to be surprised about because we look at transfers, supply bottlenecks, and IO linkages. You start with a textbook multiplier, you bring it down to 0 0.06, then you incorporate all these. Now, cross-border flows from fiscal policy are also small, and actually they are better than neighbor for most countries. This is going to depend on the strength of complementaries in trade and production network. To solve our model in this paper, we are actually uh, assuming a, a cup double, so we are uh, assuming uh, not much complementarity. So with that, there is going to be much bigger amplification, as we know from Baki Fari's work, and also as I showed in my uh, global vaccination paper. Now, there is also this problem, unfortunately, in terms of this fiscal policy flow, is that unequal global vaccination, of course, works against the policies, right? Again, going back uh, to the quotes I landed uh, yesterday, uh, overall in that vaccination paper, we calculated 49% of the costs are going to be borne by advanced countries, even if they are fully vaccinated via these supply chain issues, and especially if complementaries in the global production network is very strong. And I think one lesson we learned from this COVID shock is that at least in the short run, within a year time frame, these complementaries are actually going to be very strong. So a two-speed recovery is going to create headwinds for emerging markets due to rising global rates, and which is going to also uh, going to be combined with a rising risk premium if U.S. you know not if then actually. US monetary policy and other advanced economies monetary policy normalize. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Shabnam, for uh, an extremely rich paper and uh, so many results that uh, are very useful in the, in the policy discussions that uh, are ongoing on, on, on the implications of COVID and impressive what you managed to cover in, uh, in, this, in the time that we allotted to you. I maybe pass on directly to Fabiano for the discussion. I know he has also done some work, at least uh, I remember still from the initial part of the pandemic about the liquidity support that firms may need, and he did some very interesting calculations. So I'm sure he can uh, bring an interesting uh, view on, on, on your paper. Thank you for having me. It's of course, you know, an honor to discuss uh, Sebna and, and, and Pierre Olivier and co-authors paper, you know, their contribution to our understanding the pandemic cannot be cannot be underrated, and the fact that they got to present it at Jackson Hall shows that the, you know, the cooperation between the academia and institutions work well. It's definitely fully deserved. So, um, so what what does the paper do? Uh, as Isabel was saying, it's an extremely rich paper, so you know you need to get uh, to find your way through it. It basically studies the effects of fiscal policy during the pandemic using a very rich micro macro model, the first one, and then a macro model for the open economy part. And it's basically a, mo a paper where you run counterfactuals. You set up a model which is rich enough to allow you to, you know, to see what happened, but also to see what would have happened, for example, if uh, the policy support uh, would have not been there. And uh, uh, and then, given that they have all this richness in terms of firm level and different channels through which the pandemic hit the economy, they can also say who benefited from the interventions, what type of uh, bottlenecks uh, were more important to explain uh, the, the lack of effects, for example, um, from these interventions. So they start with uh, this closed economy model and just say the ingredients just to give an idea of how rich the model is. 
that is per metrogeneity, that are distinct demand and supply shocks, and they differ at the country and at the sectoral level, and then there are these uh, IO linkages. Okay, so modeling effort, a lot of work to collect the data, uh, so it's really a lot, right? And so, you know, when I when I was reading the paper and I got to this point, I felt like when I go and visit my mother, after a while I've seen, I haven't seen her, and she prepares this fantastic dinner, a lot of great food, and at some point I say, oh, I'm so full, and everything was so good, and she tells me, what do you mean? I mean, we still have the second course, the dessert, and the, and the, and the grappa, because, you know, then once you get to page 30, there is actually this multi-country uh, trade model on which I will not really comment on. You know, I'm, I'm, my, my international finance is at a graduate of Stell and Rogoff level. I know something about firms. I don't know much about them. And, you know, maybe would belong to, to another paper. So what are the results? Uh, so the policy worked, as we were saying, the failure, uh, failure rate declined from 9% without policy to 4.3% with, 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 with policy. And in advanced economies, it actually went below what would have been in a normal. And then, you know, given that the model is rich, they can actually say that the um, IO linkages were very important. And, you know, I actually got a, in a paper with Enrico Sette and, and Guido Tabellini, we got a similar results when we estimate the effects of zombie lending during the Great Recession, meaning that zombie lending somehow doesn't seem to be that bad for the aggregate economy because it prevents um, the disruption of, of supply chains and therefore during a recession, uh, keeping zombies alive is not as bad as we expected before doing all the calculations. The support was purely targeted, 90% uh, basically went to so the wrong firms, meaning firms that didn't need it. And then, but the support was not too bad in terms of uh, quality of firms, meaning that uh, not many zombie firms were actually, were, were actually finance. And I think this is actually in line with the emerging evidence that's coming out, for example, of using unaccredited data. And it also means that the provisions that the government has put, like, for example, not having bad loans to receive a, a guaranteed credit, actually worked. And then, and then the model predicts a modest surge of failures in 2021. And I think this is also in line with what we are seeing. Actually, I think in Italy, we see that even in 2021, failures are below what, what they were in 2019. So, you know, maybe there's even too much of a good thing. Uh, there is a persistent effect of this policy. And then, you know, there is this G model, and uh, as a seven and, uh, Explain, but is there are these negative policy spillovers that uh, you know? I don't. I mean, I can't really tell where they come from because my recollection is fiscal expansion with very uh, accommodative monetary policy should benefit uh, uh, other countries. But uh, I think this is uh, one of the main specificities of these crises compared to a start. But anyway, I, I don't have much. I don't want to have anything to say. About it. So I have three comments. So uh, uh, the, the paper goes a, a long way in describing the, uh, the data used to, to feed in the different counterfactual exercises and, uh, and, and also to feed in actual policies, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit quicker in terms of discussing parameter estimation of calibration. Well, calibration, I would say. And uh, I think it would be useful to have a section dedicated to that when you have, uh, you know, when you do model, Calibration. Here is how I calibrate them, and and also on the same uh, on the same page, it would also be useful to discuss a little bit the model fit before diving into into the, the, the counterfactuals because this is the typical you know path in, in those papers. You write a model, calibrate it, you show what happens uh, when you send the modeling. Uh, in predictions with respect to things that you can actually measure in, measure in the data to show is, you know, the predictive capacity of the model along dimensions that you have in to calibrate, for example. And that would help because, you know, there's so much in a model like this that it's really hard to assess, you know, the many different assumptions, et cetera, et cetera, what at the end of the day, what's causing what. To, so to have a little bit of, a, of, a, of model feed would be useful. And indeed, some of the assumptions are 
strong as it cannot be differently. For example, there are firms in essential sectors uh, and they face no demand shift, meaning that if you are classified as essential, the demand doesn't change, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no drop in demand. And uh, you know, when you look at the, at the data, for example, there is this uh, transport and, and storage sector that has a positive demand shock and I don't know, it doesn't confide, it doesn't actually agree with my expectations really. I think in transport actually was a big loser in this recession as far as I understand. And then there is a very big negative shock to education and that I also is not super clear to me where it comes from. Same, same thing, this wholesale and retail is, a, is, a, is also a big loser without a, a policy uh, uh, bankruptcies would actually skyrocket, sky, skyrocketed, and I understand there are many shops that actually suffer, but there are also grocery shops there that probably, you know, they are essential. And while food, food and accommodation actually even has a negative effect on, on failures, absent policies, which is also surprising to me. I'm just saying that, you know, when you have so much things, something is going to come up uh, maybe even not in line with what you expected, but to have a little bit more, uh, um, you know, discussion of calibration and model would help the reader, you know, to, to assess the, the capacity of the model. Uh, the next question is about the, the why what, what was the support so poorly targeted? And I think Nico Zorel in the uh, in the chat asked uh, what could we do to do that and here I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work and I felt a little bit bad about it but I think it was important to discuss and then Nico's question uh, says that maybe uh, it was actually a good idea. So I think there is no question that a lot of resources went to firms that did not need them and Sedman and co-authors also acknowledged it. It was no time to be picky about what to do. You know, it was a, an unprecedented crisis to so governments went for let's do something rather than uh, let's let's understand what we should do okay but the the, the assessment is actually is actually very large 90 percent of support went to firms that didn't need it okay and uh, I think this is actually a very important message and uh, given that this paper is about policy I think it should be important to qualify it more okay because uh, it might actually give rise to reactions uh, even by the fact that it's not fully understood, okay? So um, um, the paper says that in advanced economies, the GDP, the, the, you know, the, the, the interventions that were actually needed to really save uh, SMEs at the risk of uh, bankruptcy was, was really small, like 0.13% of GDP. On this number, I have two comments. One is that, you know, when I computed my, my numbers for uh, um, liquidity shortages and liquidity shortages by the way is exactly the way uh, they define failure is not they don't look at bankruptcies as, as a legal event but they say the firm goes bank or exit the market exits the market when its liquidity becomes negative and this is exactly what we do and when i did that i actually got that around here it is if you look at this graph let's only look at the last uh, bars this is in, 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 in um, uh, uh, billions euros, I'm sorry, not millions, billions euros. Uh, by December, around uh, uh, 70 billion euro were needed to save all firms, given that they focus on SMEs, that number for SMEs in Italy was around 50 billion euros. And that's around, you know, whatever, two and something percent of GDP. So, uh, I don't know, but 0.16, 0.13 seems a little bit, bit small to me. Maybe I'm missing something. The next point is that again on again on this is that the, the model only focuses on the extensive margin, which of course you know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's okay, it's a choice, but at the same time I think uh, these policies also work at the intensive margin, meaning that uh, we know, for example, from a lot of work on, on the Great Recession that. Uh, that uh, liquidity constrained firms, firms that were not at risk of going bankrupt, but they had actually maybe to cut uh, their operations because they, they couldn't finance uh, the working capital. So to avoid bankruptcies, they would just fire workers and reduce production. And I think, you know, the interventions also work 
to that dimension. Okay. So, uh, uh, and I think that it's a dimension as important as, as failures in a sense, right? Because breaking worker firm matches that actually were are, are still valuable today is like a micro uh, example of failure because we know that it takes time to recall matches, etc. And so this is I'm not saying that this is something that should be should be taken into account in the model, but in the discussion of you know the fact that uh, uh, most of the uh, most of the aid went to firms that didn't need it, I think it would be important to find aspects. So um, uh, Sebden didn't mention it, but uh, uh, in the what's next, they say that they just talk about tapering, right? And, and they talk about tapering in advanced economies vis-a-vis uh, -vis in emerging economies. And, and, and uh, so I think here, uh, uh, I don't think the job is totally done for policy, right? And indeed, when you look at the data now, the, the firm data, I just looked at the financial accounts of Italian firms for 2020, um, there are many firms that became fragile from a, from a financial point of view. Okay, and we know, and, and you know, of course, they are aware of it, and they mentioned this point in the conclusions, but, but, but only there. And uh, so this is not really a criticism to the paper, it's more a contribution to a, to a workshop on, on what should policy do now to get out of the of the of the pandemic, right? So uh, it's another paper, maybe, and it's something that I'm working on. So we know that uh, from from corporate finance that that overhang and uh, this shifting can actually prevent entrepreneurs from you know fully exploiting growth opportunities, and that could actually be a drag to the to the speed of the recovery. And so the targeting targeting point that Nico was asking, and uh, what should we do? Well, you know. There was a document by the G30 uh, led by, by Mario Draghi, Raghu Rajan, and they were saying already like uh, maybe a year ago, you know, now that the really acute phase of the uh, pandemic is gone, we might actually become a little bit pickier in what we do, to be more selective in our interventions. So let me give you just a very quick uh, 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 summary of what I think uh, we could do. This is work that I'm doing with, with Andrew Lou of Indiana. So the idea would be that now we can distinguish between firms that are economically viable, meaning firms that were good before the pandemic, and we know that quality is persistent, and who are in sectors that have good growth prospects after the pandemic, and we measure them from, from the stock. Right? Some of these firms actually had deteriorated accounts just because they were in sector heavily hit during the pandemic. So they got support, but a lot of the support was through, uh, through uh, loan guarantees. And so now they're actually, uh, you know, economically viable, but financially fragile. And so we could think about interventions targeted to, that, to this group. We do some preliminary calculations. We find that around 27 SMEs in Italy are in those conditions with good, good economic prospects, but actually, uh, uh, you know, with a, with, a, with a lot of debt in their, in their, in their balance sheets. And we also do some preliminary counterfactuals, and it turns out that it looks like doing some equity injections in this firm could be a good idea, also in terms of reducing that, uh, uh, you know, that becoming bad. And, and I think here an issue will be what will banks do once you know the, the, all these guarantees come to an end? Will they actually, on firms that don't look that great, will they actually decide to exercise the guarantee with the government? And, and that these firms fail or not. And I think you know, this is a point that will become important at some point, and we might as well start thinking about it. So again, great paper. Thanks for giving me the chance to discuss it. And that's it, I'm done. Thanks, Fabiano. Um, just checking with Sebland, do you want to react immediately to the points of Fabiano, or shall I? I have two questions in the chat as well. So. Okay, let me quickly react to Fabio. So, I mean, great comments. I mean, I actually, I, there's nothing that I, I disagree. Uh, let me just clarify uh, uh, one point, two points actually. The one is on this counterfactual cost, right? So, the, our 0 0.13 number and Fabio's 2% GDP number for Italy. I fully agree with that. I, I, and I think this is very important because that counterfactual is basically, you know, what the uh, model 
gives you when you go and pick these viable firms with a tweezer, right? Which you cannot do in real life, but obviously you can do within the context of model, but still you are using the firm level balance sheet data. So that number is an average number. It is going to be higher in countries like Italy when you have a weaker position, which also explains uh, the importance of this recent work Fabio doing and others. Now we should be really doing that work, right? I mean, look at the real time data, the site is out. I mean, you know, how weak they were entering the uh, COVID, which was the data we view. But now, what that change in this current financial position and see what can we do in terms of their financial weakness and all that. I, I fully agree. Fabio is doing, Fabiano is doing great work on that. Uh, ben Alcre did uh, a, a paper looking at that French data. Now, let me be very clear. This type of work needs very detailed administrative data, right? As the Italian credit register or European on a credit or in the, in the, in the French work detailed also uh, confidential data for France. The, our paper is, remember, the, the point is we wrote this paper, we wrote the first draft starting in, you know, our, our first paper in May 2020, right? So the idea is what can you do in the middle of the crisis when you don't have the data and then no, and even there is confidential data that get, cannot be collected like that and it will be, even if it's there, it's, some of it will be there only available to uh, some regulators, right? So the idea here is like, okay, what can we do when we don't have any of that with a simple model? And now actually we show that this works pretty well. Uh, so that's, that's the idea, right? But just in terms of understanding, you know, who is viable, who is not viable, bringing more confidential data on that, and then try to understand, well, maybe we kind of uh, smooth the crisis by making an economic viable, but now they have all this leverage. So we should do more. I, I fully agree with all those points. And in fact, now I'm working with US credit registry, and this is even more important for US because with Italy and with uh, ECB on a credit, we always have access to these data. Unfortunately, in US, we knew nothing about the small firms financing because US, well, they don't file. But now, thank God, there is this regulatory data at the Federal Reserve start being collected after actual Lehman collapse as part of the Frank Act. And we have written a paper uh, using this data and showing that actually small firms in US are no different than the you know, European small firms. They are fully bank dependent. Uh, they are going to have all these leverage problems, even more so now moving forward. So this is definitely a number one uh, policy issue. I fully agree with Fabian. So great, thanks, Stefan. Let me immediately jump to the two questions that were in the chat. And meanwhile, I also solicit anybody who wants to still ask a question to raise their hands when they're a panelist, or otherwise put it in the chat. So the first question, I think actually Fabiano gave a partly already a suggested answer on it is, um, you know, how could a more targeted uh, policy support for SMEs look like in, in real time? So uh, this was a question from Nico Sorel. Yeah. And the second question was, was really on the data because, um, and I think it's driven by what we know about Euro area, where of course a large part of the support was in the form of, of, of government guarantees basically, right? And so of course, um, only a small part of them were called upon, uh, many didn't materialize in reality, but at least our analysis would, would say that they still had a, a positive impact on, on private sector expectations. And I mean, you also see, especially actually in combination with the monetary policy measures, we see that they have been quite powerful in supporting the macroeconomy. So um, the question is, did you somehow, or how would you somehow include these guarantees in your analysis? Did you do that, or, or how could you do that? And if not, what would be the implications of that kind of support if you consider, if you would uh, reflect them as well in your analysis? So these are the two questions that I, I um, see here in the chat. We'll be looking yeah. for some answers. Yeah, no, the, on the targeting is exactly. So this is, more, we should do more work, right? I mean, let me be very clear. None of the policies were targeted. I mean, like PPP to put together in, in a week. I mean, the German and French programs also, like, you know, literally less than two weeks. So nothing is started. No, no policy paper went, like, you know, to the, to the, the, the battlefield and let me take, a, you know, surgery and find out. So this is not that. But I, again, completely fully agree with Fabiana that we should do this now moving forward. This makes this data issue, like, number one priority. Okay, so we are doing a model-based exercise because we cannot do targeting using data. Why can we not do it? I wrote a policy proposal in as early as April 22, 2020, literally one month in the pandemic, titled Negative SME Tax. I argue that, okay, we should not be dealing with banks. So the IRS, and I wrote it for you as immediately should be a negative SME tax now and claw back later. That's like, about, this doesn't happen, right? I mean, we had all these policies down to banks, to accommodate ways. When they were trying to put the PPP, they were trying to access from financial policy. They cannot, because in US, unfortunately, 
the, the census data and this regulatory credit register that's completely separate and they could they can, cannot match them because there are different regulatory jurisdictions so this actually makes the importance of data sets like on a credit data sets like real time we can see what is going on with firm finances during the shock so we can do targeting better this is this is super important and in fact now, you know, this work is being done, Fabian's new paper, this new French paper in San Francisco, I know they are matching the PPP data to the regulatory credit register of the U.S. They are trying to understand how targeted it is, you know, which ones got it on all this. All this needs real-time data to be done. So our, our contribution here is like we have none of it. What can we do as a policymaker in the middle of the crisis? So how much we can do? So that's, that goes without saying. And then the second question is the pandemic loans are, are the ones with guarantees, right? We are, we, are, we are using those. We use data from ESRB on that. Of course, again, we are going to fall short of really which firm got what, right? The take up rates and the disbursement we use from the ESRB data, but then we don't know firm X got this much, firm Y got. This is exactly this new work now being done, right? So that's exactly why we are very careful of saying this is the disbursement, right? The actual cost to the government, that has to be evaluated once this is all out. But in our paper, we did, a, of course, an exercise saying, okay, say the firms all, you know, uh, paid it or they, they are forced to pay. Say it's a five-year loan with a government guarantee. They are forced to pay right away what happened. And even under those scenarios, we didn't find a meltdown. The meltdown comes if something goes wrong on the monetary policy side and we are back to a banking crisis issue where banks refuse to roll over the existing debt and things like that. If you go back to a scenario like 2008, 2009, then we are going to have problems, okay? So, and, but to calculate all these things, we do need to know what is going on real time. But we did say, okay, if these government guarantees, everything is paid back, what happens? What is the cost of government? And the cost to government, of course, is going to still be very high because the programs are not designed as I'm going to flow back this excess profit tax, you know, so that's exactly what was my proposal about that. They are not designed like that. I mean, most of them design, uh, you know, you have to keep employment at PPP, then it turns into a grant or you pay almost like zero interest rate over five years. And, and the, that's done because governments make banks do it like that, right? And in fact, now in the US, uh, people are finding that before the government involvement, uh, no bank is, is doing any lending, which is very interesting because this is not a banking crisis, right? It's understandable that we are in 2008, 2009, then banks got the shock themselves. They are just like cutting the credit supply and all. Now, I mean, nothing happened to them. The monetary policy is like record, uh, you know, uh, accommodative, and they still don't do it. Why? Because this goes back to this issue that I originally showed in my QGE paper, the financial concerns are size dependent. Small firms are financial concerns. Okay, if governments weren't involved, there is no way banks are going to go and tell those restaurants, oh, I'm so sorry, your earnings crashed, let me give you some money so you can smooth out this liquidity shock. That's why we look at liquidity, okay? They are not going to do that at all. Even themselves are not on the control, uh, facing a shock. That's what I think government programs achieve very successfully. Yes, not targeted, inefficient, money wasted, but they achieve if, they, if the, the idea is let's prevent this failure and unemployment from skyrocketing they did achieve. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I can actually compliment. We have a, a survey for small companies uh, in, in, in uh, the ECB that we run. I don't know if you know, it's a safe survey. Yes. I pointed towards it because it gives a bit of indication yeah. as well. Of exactly. This. Yeah, we cite your survey. You say the same, same thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But what I mean is like in our paper, we kind of model this and we show how these shots can amplify in a world like that instead of everybody's facing the same financial frictions versus small firms facing a much much uh, rigid one, and it is very clear in your survey, yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, no further questions came in. I think people are still digesting all the results and the richness of the paper. And actually, we're also over time for the conference overall, so maybe I, I just suggest that we close it here, and I'm sure people may come back to you with questions on, on yes. this. Uh, Please email me. Uh, any questions you couldn't ask, you can definitely email me. Yeah, thank you so much. Very good. And then maybe it's, uh, I, I would still like to spend everybody's uh, time for one minute to thank all the organizers of the conference. So this was Jacopo Cimadomo, Demos uh, Ioannou, Bartos Makoviak, Leo von Tarn, and Nico Zorel. And uh, I would also very much want to thank uh, Anna Maria Borlescu for making sure that everything runs very smooth uh, operationally as well. So um, thanks to them and thanks to everybody who joined into the conference and in particular to the presenters and discussions for the for the great papers and the great discussions. And I wish everybody a very nice weekend as well. Thanks. Bye.